Today's video is kindly sponsored by ExpressVPN. Find out how you can get three months of ExpressVPN for free by visiting expressvpn.com slash Kendall Ray or clicking the link in my description box. Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. So today we're talking about a topic that I find really, really interesting, and that is the death of Princess Diana. It's just one of those things that's always intrigued me and it's so sketchy. There's so much to go over here. If you've never heard the full story of her death, you definitely need to hear it. I did do a video on her death when I first started doing videos like this almost five years ago, but I wanted to revisit it now just because my whole process for making these videos has completely changed. And lately after the last big interview with Harry and Meghan, I have been finding myself kind of re-intrigued by the royals again. The thing about Americans is we don't really know shit about anywhere else but America, at least most of us. And one thing we really never learn much about anywhere and we don't get a lot of news on or anything is the royals. So I'm aware that a lot of you watching this are probably a lot more into the royal family than me and just know a lot more about them because they've been a part of your lives forever. And then there's probably a lot of you that don't know anything about the royal family. So I'm going to try to break down this story as simply as I can. So first of all, Diana Frances Spencer. Who is she? Where does she come from? She was born July 1st, 1961, and she was the youngest daughter of British nobles John Spencer and Frances Shand. And one misconception that people seem to have about Diana or had about Diana is that she was kind of a commoner who was suddenly whisked into the princess role. But it turns out that she was very used to this whole world of the royals and her family was very close with the royal family. She definitely came from money. She lived in a huge house growing up. She grew up with her two sisters, Sarah and Jane, and her younger brother, Charles. She did have another brother named John, but unfortunately he died when he was just about an infant and that was the year before she was born. Diana's parents divorced when she was only about seven years old and she took it really, really hard. Her father ended up getting custody of the kids. Her mom is just described as truly being an awful mother, someone that probably shouldn't have been a mother. So she was happy with the custody arrangement to be with her father. Later on, she would describe her childhood as unhappy and unstable. She had a really hard time just at home and also in school, but she was a creative kid. She was a very thoughtful kid from a young age. She played the piano. She also did swimming and diving. So she was a very active kid. And like I said, her family had been close to the royals for generations, generations and generations. So much so that the royals let them lease a property, a special property on their land. It was on one of the queen's private estates and this place was huge. And so they grew up close by to the royals and they grew up playing with the princes. And from a very young age, I think she straight up knew she wanted to be royal. But one thing that she said is she would get married in Kensington Palace. And it seemed that Diana knew from a young age that she was gonna be important or she was going to somehow make herself important. So Diana grew up around the royals and she really liked Charles from a young age. He was much, much older than her though. So it was kind of one of those little girl crushes, but she always loved the idea of marrying him and maybe becoming a royal herself. And then when she was 16, Diana first met Prince Charles and he was 29 at the time. He was actually dating her older sister, Sarah, at the time. And she was just the younger sister who was around. Then when she was 17, she moved to London when she was done with finishing school, of course. And she moved into a flat with seven other friends. And during this time, Diana took a bunch of low paying jobs. She definitely did not consider herself above any type of work, even though she came from wealth. She was a nanny at one point, a house cleaner, even a hostess. So then in the summer of 1980, Prince Charles started showing interest in Diana. They started dating and the paparazzi were really into it. They would literally follow them around on dates. This is one of their early dates that were filmed and their relationship just moved really, really fast. Now here's the thing with the royal family, right? A lot of them used to marry each other. They would keep it very controlled. So they don't let the king or the prince, Prince Charles in this case, just go out and marry anybody. Love is not enough. They've got to have the looks, they've got to have the poise, and they basically have to be approved. And Prince Charles at the time was actually kind of in love with someone else. I mean, he was. Camilla, 
And there was a lot of tension between Diana and Camilla because Camilla was always around, but there was a lot of pressure on Charles as he was getting older to pick someone, get married, and start making heirs to the throne. So he decides that Diana is a good fit and he decides to propose to her in February of 1981. And at first, Diana didn't agree right away to marry Charles. She actually had to think about it for a little while because she had grown up around the royals and she knew what all went into being part of their family. But eventually she agreed. And this was a huge role. She could possibly be the queen one day. And there's a lot of debate when it comes to Charles and Diana. Was there ever love between them? A lot of people say that Diana truly loved Charles. Um, a lot of people say Charles truly loved Diana. But most people say that this seemed to be kind of forced. And it seems like Charles was never really in it. Diana, on the other hand, that's where the question mark lies. Like how into him was she actually? Was she ever really in love with him or did she like the idea of being a royal? And there's this interview clip that is really telling of how their relationship was at the time. I, I'm amazed that she's uh, been brave enough to take me on. <laughs> and I suppose in love? Of course. <laughs> Whatever in love means. <laughs> If you couldn't hear what he said, he said, yes, of course, I'm in love with her, whatever love means. Now, Diana claims that this isn't the first time he said this. They said this privately to her another time. And when you look at this clip, knowing that he has a side chick, you realize that's who he's talking to. He doesn't want Camilla to think that he isn't in, in love with Diana for real. When you marry, in my position, you're going to marry somebody who perhaps one day is gonna become queen. And you've got to choose somebody very carefully, I think, who, who could fulfill this particular role. Because people like you, perhaps, would expect quite a lot from somebody like that. And it's got to be somebody pretty special. And later on, she described that moment where he said that as being traumatizing. She was just devastated that he would say something like that. I was brought up in the sense that, you know, when you got engaged with someone, you love them. And the most extraordinary thing is we had this ghastly interview um, the day we were announced our engagement and this ridiculous ITN man said, are you in love? So I thought, what a thick question. So I said, yes, of course we are, in the sort of fat, slow and ranger that I was. And Charles turned around and said, what in ever in love means? And that threw me completely. I thought, what a strange question. What a strange question. God, how does it traumatise me? But they were gonna be getting married, which was a huge deal. And a big royal wedding like this actually hadn't happened in years at this point. So everyone was really excited. All eyes were on Diana for sure. I left my flat the last time. I said I had a policeman. And my policeman the night before, before the engagement had said to me, I just want you to know that this is your last night of freedom ever in the rest of your life, so make the most of it. And it's like a sword went in my heart. And people really seemed to love Diana or hate her because she wasn't the stereotypical British royal. She was the first woman to ever have a job before marrying into the royal family. She also was described as being very strong-willed, which is apparent as you watch this all play out throughout the years. But she also is described as being very honest and genuine. And their wedding was a fairy tale. It took place on July 29th. 1981 but as most of you know royal weddings are a big deal even people over here in the u.s set alarms for like three four in the morning to watch them and their fairy tale wedding was viewed by over 750 million people before that the most viewed event was landing on the moon but this just blew that out of the water and one thing that was highly noted about the wedding is the idea that diana was going to have things her way. She was going to be this new kind of royal because in the vows, she actually made them remove the word obey, which I've always hated that. I mean, who even has that in their wedding vows nowadays? I promise to obey, but her taking that part out of the vows was huge. Take Diana Francis. Take the Charles Philip Arthur George. Take the Charles Philip Arthur George. To my wedded husband. To my wedded husband. It was clear that she was gonna be a different type of princess. And it seemed like the royals from the beginning were very concerned about what that could look like for them. So now as the princess of Wales, Diana was the third highest ranking woman in the royal family after Queen Elizabeth. And then of course her mother, the queen mother who did pass away. At just 20 years old, Diana now suddenly had all of this power and serious influence, and the royals weren't always happy with how she used it. And they started to get frustrated because Diana became 
the main star of the show, really. I mean, when her and Charles would go out, people would barely care about Charles. People would be screaming Diana's name. All the paparazzi liked her the most. People were most interested in her. If she was on the cover of something, it's gonna sell way more. She started being referred to as the people's princess because she was so relatable and she would get out there and be with the people. And this only continued more so throughout the years. And once they were married, the pressure was on for them to make that heir and a spare, as they say. And Diana did that. First, she had Prince William in 1982, and then she had Prince Harry in 1984. And when it came to being a mother, she was unlike any other royal had ever been before. First of all, she chose their names, which I guess that's not really your job normally for the mother to choose the name of the baby, but hey. And then she hired her own nanny because she didn't like the nanny that the royal family had. And then she didn't use the nanny too much because she spent most of her time taking care of her boys, bathing them, dressing them, you know, doing enrichment activities, taking them to the park. Like she literally would take them to school. No other royal is doing that. She planned her whole schedule around the kids' schedules, which was totally different. And people loved that she was this really relatable mom. I think a lot of other mothers could kind of connect with her in that way. And all of this really irritated the royal family and also people that were working for the crown, which that's the one thing that a lot of us don't understand about the royals. There are people that work with the royals. There's the royals and then there's this establishment that works with them and controls them. And they wanted Diana to kind of shrink her personality a little bit. You know, you're standing out a bit too much. You're being a little too relatable. But Diana only amped all that up. She started really forging her own path in charity work and she did some amazing things. One of the most amazing things that Diana ever did, one of the most profound things she ever did was back when the AIDS crisis was going on and there was all this misinformation about how AIDS was spread. She was actually one of the first people to shake hands with someone who had AIDS openly, have it photographed, and prove that it does not spread that way. She did not see herself as above anybody. She spent her time with the sick, the dying, the poor, and she advocated for those who suffered with mental illness. What I have found, both in my own experience and in my visits to organizations which support couples and children in difficulty, is that there are certain common ingredients essential for families of all sizes and types. There must, of course, be love, but love in its most practical forms. Commitment to each other, sharing together, self-discipline, and some self-sacrifice. And as the years went on, she was only more and more loved by the public. And this only added to tensions between her and the crown. But despite her popularity, she was absolutely scrutinized by the media. Over the years, Diana had more and more negative news stories coming out about her and they were never denounced by the royal family. There was no protection for her at all. The media attention was insanely overwhelming to her and isolating. You have to stay in all the time. You have to ask permission to go anywhere. There's all these protocols and it makes your life extremely depressing. Diana at this time was really struggling being a royal. She always felt like she wasn't meeting her expectations and she also felt some passive aggressive energy that the royals did not want her to actually be in a position of power ever. People did not understand they had binoculars on me the whole time. They hired the opposite fat, looked into my bedroom. I cried like a baby in the four walls. I just couldn't cope with it. So that first week was such a traumatic week for me. I learned to be royal in one week. I was thrown into the deep end. Nobody ever helped me at all. They'd be there to criticize, but never be there to say well done. And during this time, Diana became very depressed. Charles said I was crying wolf. And I said I just felt so desperate and I was crying my eyes out. And he said, I'm not gonna listen. You're always doing this to me. He said, I'm going riding now. So I threw myself down the stairs. Bearing in mind I was carrying a child. Queen comes out, absolutely horrified, shaking. She's so frightened. I knew I wasn't going to lose the baby. Quite bruised around the start. And Charles went out riding. And when he came back, you know, it was just dismissal. Total dismissal. After five years of being married, my sister Jane came up to see me. And I had a V neck on and um, shorts. She said, Dutch, what's that marking on your chest? And I said, oh, it's nothing. She said, what is it? And the night before, 
I wanted to talk to Charles about something. He wouldn't listen to me, so I was crying wolf. So I picked up his pen knife off his dressing table and um, scratched myself heavily mm. down my chest and my both both thighs. And there was a lot of blood. And it hadn't made any reaction whatsoever. One thing about the royals is they want to look perfect. They don't want to look like they have emotional issues. And they did not like that Diana was openly talking about her mental health. Diana experienced bulimia from the pressure of being a royal, and she actually said this was caused by Prince Charles, that he grabbed her waist when they first got married and said, getting a bit chubby there. After she had her babies, she had postpartum depression, she thought about taking her own life, and she was the first royal family member to ever talk about these things publicly. And eventually things got even worse because Diana found out that Charles had reconnected with Camilla, which who knows if they were seeing each other that whole time or if there was a break, I'm not really sure. But whatever it was, was back on and Diana was not happy about it. And apparently when she confronted him about the affair, he said, well, I refuse to be the only Prince of Wales who never had a mistress. I'm on the telephone and he's brought on his hand and then saying, whatever happens, I'll always love you. And I told him I listened to the door. Charles seemed to be able to make Diana upset with just a few words. He seemed to have broke her heart over and over again by never giving her the love and devotion that she truly wanted. She wanted a husband that was around more. She got depressed feeling like she was always alone. My husband made me feel so um, inadequate in every possible way, but each time I came up for air, he pushed me down again. And all that loneliness led her to have an affair of her own. She ended up hooking up with James Hewitt. And there's a lot of speculation that this guy, who is an actor, is Prince Harry's real father because they look just like each other. I mean, it's really crazy. This is probably one of the biggest royal family conspiracies that people are very split on. Some people are absolutely certain that Harry is actually this guy's son. And other people think that there was no affair. He just happens to have red hair. And that's the end of that. I mean, could you imagine if it was an affair? I mean, if Harry's really not actually part of the royal bloodline at all? Hmm, it definitely makes you think. Allegedly, James had gotten with Diana about 18 months before Harry was born, and they had hooked up several times over that whole time period. So it's possible he could be the dad, but no one can confirm anything. But clearly their marriage was disintegrating and they were both happier with other people and apart. So they officially announced their separation in 1992. Then three years later in November of 1995, Diana gave this exclusive interview to the BBC. And this was a big deal. This is a super famous interview. She discussed all the loneliness in her marriage and all the unhappiness in her life as a royal. And she talked very openly about her and Charles affairs. And when all this came out, it seemed like the public, most of the public loved her enough that they really didn't care that she cheated. I'd like to be a queen of people's hearts in people's hearts, but I don't see myself being queen of this country. I don't think many people would want me to be queen. Actually, when I say many people, I mean the establishment that I'm married into because they've decided that I'm a non-starter because I do things differently because I don't go by a rule book, because I lead from the heart, not the head. And albeit that's got me into trouble in my work, I understand that. But someone's got to go out there and love people and show it. And do you think that because of the way you behave, that's precluded you effectively from becoming queen? Yes, I, well, not precluded me, I wouldn't say that. Um, I just don't think I have as many supporters in that environment than I did. Than I did. Uh, they see me as a, a threat of some kind, and I'm here to do good. Not a dis I'm not a destructive person. I think every strong woman in history has had to walk down a similar path, and I think it's the strength that causes the confusion and the fear. Why is she strong? Where does she get it from? Where is she taking it? Where is she going to use it? Why do the public still support her? When I say public, you go in and do an engagement, and there's a great many people there. But the interview really hurt Charles' reputation and the reputation of the whole royal family, and they were pissed. So about a month after the interview airs, the queen advises them to go ahead and get divorced. They were hoping to avoid more scandal in the royal family, but 
Diana did not make this process easy. Instead of letting the palace control the story of the divorce as they wanted to, Diana went ahead and released her own statement. And then while they were discussing the terms of the divorce, Diana actually brought up that Charles had impregnated his assistant, Tiggy, that she was pregnant with his baby, but that she had an abortion. Apparently Tiggy was very upset by this and so was Charles. He was outraged and her lawyer demanded an apology from Diana. So no one knows if that little bit is true or not, but they did end up coming to a final settlement in their divorce in August of 1996 and then the divorce was final. And in the terms of the divorce, Diana actually lost her title as her royal highness. Now I've heard completely conflicting things about how this happened. I've heard some reports that the queen wanted her title taken away and Charles didn't really care and was fine with her keeping it. I've heard the complete opposite, that the queen was okay with her keeping her title because she still has children who are in the royal family and that Charles did it just to spite her. But either way, her official title was removed and this really upset her. The day that it happened, she was just laying in bed and was crying, worried that people wouldn't take her seriously anymore. So eventually Diana moved on and Charles went back with Camilla, which is a whole interesting can of worms in itself that I don't have much time to talk about today. Camilla and Charles are still together. The queen still does not like her because of the cheating scandal and refuses to be like seen with her in certain places, stand with her in certain areas. They've made Camilla like sit alone at places, but Diana's free now, right? And in the summer of 1997, she starts dating this guy named Dodi Faid. He's a film producer and the son of an Egyptian billionaire. And even though Diana was no longer a royal, one thing that she did not escape was the paparazzi. They continue to be obsessed with her, probably even more so. So that morning they were just relaxing. They were out on this boat together and the whole day they were being chased by paparazzi. This is something she was pretty used to, but they were especially bad during this time. And the night of August 7th, 1997, Diana and Dodie were staying at the Ritz Hotel in Paris, which was owned by Dodie's father. They are staying in this special suite that many other celebrities had stayed in before them. Super, super fancy. There was this really fancy jewelry store that they had ordered two rings from, and they were actually delivered to their suite in their hotel. And this cannot be confirmed and probably will never be confirmed. But according to a friend, Dodie was planning to propose to Diana that night. And I mean, with two rings, it uh, seems, seems possible, right? That that was the plan. They also had reservations at a very nice restaurant that night. So it looked like this was actually gonna happen. And there were rumors that there was some type of big announcement coming from the couple. So the paparazzi were extra bad. They had a very bad time with the press because they literally haunted me and hunted me. Everywhere they tried to go, they were harassed by reporters, no matter what what they did. So that night they tried to go to dinner and when they tried to get to the restaurant, they couldn't because there was a swarm of paparazzi harassing them. So they went back to the hotel around 9.50 and planned on just having dinner at the restaurant at the hotel. But Dodie actually believed that some of the guests in the restaurant were paparazzi in disguise. So he decided to have them eat in their suite instead. Just after midnight, they decided to go back to Dodie's apartment from the hotel, I'm not sure why. But when they went outside, reporters were still waiting outside for them to come out, which is so annoying. I can't imagine what that'd be like. Sometimes they would yell at her, call her names, even spit on her just to get a reaction and a more scandalous photo. There was no separation between her private and public life. I think having paparazzi sounds kind of glamorous to people, but it seems like every celebrity on earth absolutely hates the paparazzi, especially the ones that get followed the most and harassed. Hey, good morning, Kanye. And on this night, Diana just wanted to leave with her boyfriend. She was sick of the paparazzi, following them, harassing them, stalking their every move. So they made this plan to lose them. They were gonna have Diana's security team wait out front of the hotel, make it look like she was going to be coming out and leaving. Meanwhile, Henri Paul, who was the head of security at the Ritz and an interesting character, a huge character in this story, would drive them over to Dodie's apartment from the back entrance. They'd be driving in one of the hotel's limos, which was a black Mercedes S280, but one of her bodyguards, Trevor Reese Jones, refused to let her go without security. So he went with them and he sat in the passenger seat 
Diana and Dodie got in the back and Henri Paul was driving. They left shortly after midnight, but unfortunately they did not leave undiscovered and some paparazzi caught wind that they were back there, went around to the back and followed them. And only five minutes into their drive, Henri Paul drove the car into the Pont de la Mans tunnel. He lost control of the car and crashed into the 13th pillar inside. And this was a loud crash. I mean, a lot of different people heard it. And this was a really bad wreck, guys. I mean, her car was crunched. Look at this. It doesn't look survivable. And for the most part, it wasn't. Trevor, her bodyguard, was the only one who survived. And that was because he was wearing a seatbelt. And most of the time, bodyguards didn't even wear seatbelts at this time. So it was kind of a move that really saved his life in the end because no one else in the car was wearing seatbelts and no one else survived. Dodie was actually thrown out of the limo and landed about 20 yards away from it. And Henri Paul probably died instantly at the scene. There's this doctor named Frederick Mali, and he claims that when he got to the limo, Diana was still alive and that she was calling out for Dodie. And as this whole scene is unfolding, the paparazzi is doing nothing to help. They chased them into that tunnel, so they were all there, and all they did was take pictures. That doctor said that they were only a few centimeters from her face taking these pictures. And according to him, her last words were, oh my God, leave me alone, leave me alone, which is ugh, really, really upsetting to think about. The wreckage was so bad that they actually had to cut Diana out of the limo with a chainsaw. And I guess in France, and I'm not sure how it is now, but back then at least, the way that they deal with emergency situations was completely different. In America, we get people in ambulances and get them to the hospital as fast as possible in most cases. In France back then, they would treat on the scene and then transport once a patient is stable enough to make the ride. So Diana wasn't actually transported to the hospital until 1.20 a.m. This is over an hour after the accident happened. On the way there, Diana suffered cardiac arrest. They stopped the ambulance twice actually to resuscitate her. And she finally reached the hospital at 2 a.m. The accident was at 12.23, guys. That's insane. This is Princess Diana. As soon as she got there, they rushed her into surgery and they said that she died on the table. There was nothing that they could do. Diana was pronounced dead at 4.01 a.m. She was only 36 years old and the news of her death shocked the world. Diana, Princess of Wales, has been seriously injured in a car accident in Paris. We interrupt this film to tell you we are getting reports that Diana, Princess of Wales, has been badly injured in a car crash in France. It's been reported in the last few minutes that Diana, Princess of Wales, has been seriously injured in a car crash in Paris. I'm Patrick Stinson with breaking news coverage. Princess Diana is seriously injured and two other people have died following a car crash in Paris. Diana is dead. She died at four o'clock this morning. We have reports from Paris that Diana, Princess of Wales, has been killed in a car accident and that her partner, Dodie Fired, has also been killed. They were apparently being pursued by paparazzi. The world has lost a, a princess who is, quite frankly, irreplaceable, and Mr. Al Fired has lost a, a greatly loved eldest son. We're having a swell time, although Princess Diana has been injured gravely. It's been reported, allegedly. They we're watching it on <laughs> CNN. There's a huge accident. Allegedly. It happened two I hours ago. It's breaking news. It has changed. <gasps> Princess Diana seriously injured. Oh. They've added the word uh, seriously. That's not good. That's not good. In other words, her face got it. Dodi Al Fayed is dead, as was the driver from the Ritz. You know that will be the most photographed car. What in a bitch of life. Roadside assistance. With loads of towing. Oh. <laughs> Princess Diana dead. <gasps> oh, ah! right, where's the remote? Oh. Oh my god. Oh my god. But it appears to be official. Uh, Princess Diana, at the age of 36, has died of massive internal injuries she uh, suffered in a car accident along with her companion, Dodi Al Fayed. And pretty much right away, people were suspicious of this accident. And like I said, her bodyguard Trevor survived the crash, but he was 
really badly injured. He broke every single bone in his face and he had brain and chest trauma. So he ended up being in the hospital for over 10 days in a coma. People were really hoping that when he woke up, maybe he would remember something important. But when he woke up, all he remembered was getting into the limo back at the hotel and then it just went black. So at first it seemed like the narrative that they were pushing about the accident was that Diana died because of the paparazzi, that they chased her into the tunnel and caused her death. But this all very quickly changed when they got the official report back on Henri Paul. French officials concluded that the accident was caused by reckless driving on behalf of Henri Paul. It turns out Henri was driving about 65 miles an hour and was allegedly drunk and not just buzzed or lightly drunk. I mean, this guy was wasted according to the reports. His blood alcohol level was more than three times the legal limit. And it's confusing because he was working that day. But what many people don't know is he was working and then he went home for a bit because he lived very close by. So some people think he went home and just drank a bunch of wine. And then he was called back to work later in the evening and he came back just completely wasted. But the problem with that theory is that there is footage of him at the hotel that night where he looks completely fine. He doesn't look drunk at all. And this footage has been highly, highly scrutinized by people. There's definitely more to get into when it comes to Henri Paul, and I will later in this video, but another really strange thing that I think really caught people off guard right away is that the tunnel was washed with some type of detergent spray hosed down and then reopened to the public in like 24 hours. And that was the end of that, or so authorities thought. But people would go on to speculate to this day about what actually caused that crash. People started talking about the idea that this was a planned accident very, very early on, like right away. But a full inquest into the crash didn't happen for nearly 10 years. And during that time, there was so much public pressure on British officials that they were forced to launch Operation Paget, which was an inquiry to establish whether there was any truth to the conspiracy theories. It started in 2004 and wasn't completed until 2008. And their inquest confirmed to them that her death was caused by Henri Paul's drunk driving, but they also put some blame on the paparazzi, which it seems like people fall into one of three categories. You either believe the royal family or some type of power over them took her out, or you believe it really was reckless driving, or you believe that the paparazzi caused her death. So that night, because they were being chased, Henri Paul drove into that tunnel going 65 miles an hour, which is incredibly dangerous. Some people argue that he could have been going even faster than that. And after they did some research into it, it seems that this is normal practice for the paparazzi, that they will chase you that fast and that there was a lot of these kind of races going on. So they ended up looking at nine photographers and one motorcycle driver, and they were investigated as possibly causing involuntary homicide and for failing to aid the victims. Instead of doing anything to help, they just stood around taking pictures. And there's this idea that they possibly could have purposely caused that crash to get good photos. Three eyewitnesses saw this bright light flash in the tunnel. They said it was much brighter than a camera flash and it definitely could have blinded Henri Paul as he drove into the tunnel. And during the British inquest, two additional people came forward with the same story. And British authorities have never been able to figure out what actually caused that bright light. British authorities couldn't understand how it didn't blind everyone else that was in the tunnel. So they determined that it just never happened. Also, right before the crash, it said that there was a white Fiat Uno that hit the back of their limo and pushed it into the pillar. And this mystery Fiat apparently sped away afterwards. One couple said that they were almost hit by the Fiat as it swerved around them in the tunnel. Also, authorities found white paint on the side view mirror and the bumper of the limo and pieces of plastic in their wreckage that matched the Fiat. And apparently French authorities spent two years searching for this mystery Fiat and never found it. They never positively identified the driver, but there are a few suspects. There's this taxi driver named Lee Van Than, who was a 22 year old at the time of the crash, and he owned a white Fiat Uno, and he was identified by a witness as the driver. And according to his father, he actually 
went and woke his brothers up in the middle of the night a few hours after the crash and had them help paint his Fiat from white to red. And not only that, he also replaced the bumpers on the car. He was interviewed by the French police for six hours, but he refused to attend the British inquest. French authorities claimed that he wasn't interviewed further because they had checked into his alibi already and ruled him out. And what's interesting is his alibi was that he was at work all day, but it turns out he actually left work early that day. So his alibi does not hold up. The owner of the Fiat also could have been this photojournalist named James Anderson. And he had been following Diana for weeks. And in the week before her death, he followed her everywhere. And some people and authorities believe that he was really an informant for MI6, which if you don't know what MI6 is, it's basically like the FBI. It's one of the UK's intelligence and security agencies. And what's really interesting about this James Anderson guy is less than six hours after the crash, he boarded a flight from Paris to Corsica, which is an island in the Mediterranean. And his reason for flying to this island has never been revealed. So that's super weird. At first, his wife gave him an alibi and said that he was home with her at the time of the crash. But later on, she retracted this statement and said she could have been wrong. Shortly after the crash, he also painted his Fiat and sold it. He was very briefly interviewed by French police and almost immediately cleared. And after this, for months, James would go around bragging to his friends, allegedly, that he had explosive photos of Diana at the crash. But then in 2000, they found him in a BMW that was parked in a forest in the south of France and someone had lit this car on fire out there and the whole car was just completely charred. In fact, his body was so burned that it took over a month for them to figure out this was James Anderson. And the fireman who found him also said that he had two gunshot wounds to the head. The autopsy report said that there was only one bullet hole in his left temple and that his death was caused by the heat of the fire, not the gunshot wound. And they ruled his death a suicide. So there's clearly a lot of questions about this guy's death because why would he want to kill himself by setting himself on fire. I mean, his body was in such bad condition after he was burned that his head literally separated from his body and were in different parts of the car. So I don't think that's something that he would just decide to do. The only survivor of the crash at this point was Trevor. And as time went on, he started to remember more and more about the night of the crash. He specifically recalled that there was a motorbike that followed them into the tunnel and that it had been following them for a while and was sitting next to them at all the red lights they hit on the way. And before the crash happened, a witness described this same motorbike and said that it was driving on the right side of the limo and kind of cut off Henri Paul making it so he couldn't exit the tunnel. According to this witness, after the crash, this man walked over to the scene calmly, held up his hands in an X, like he was signaling to someone or something, and then got back on his motorbike and left. Didn't even take photos, so why was he there? And witnesses have described seeing several motorcycles around the car that night. Some witnesses even say there was up to five motorcycles in the tunnel that night. Now, it would be really nice if there was some video footage, surveillance of this tunnel, so we could clear up some of these questions but there is none. Even though there were 14 CCTV cameras in the tunnel that night, guys, 14, and not one of them was working. Not one of them picked up anything. Some of them were turned around the opposite way. Some of them were switched off and authorities claimed that none of the cameras were even working that day. But this has been highly debated because there was a person who got a speeding ticket from one of those cameras conveniently 15 minutes after the accident occurred. And there also happened to be no CCTV footage at all on their whole trek from the hotel to the tunnel, which is insane because they passed tons of cameras on the way. So let's talk a little bit more about Henri Paul, the driver of the car. There's been a lot of speculation that he possibly could have been working for MI6. In fact, it sounds like he was. It seems like he was working with them as some type of informant at the hotel. He was the head of security, so he knew a lot about what went on in the hotel and he would feed them information. So many people have speculated that he was hired to cause this crash. And it gets even weirder. It turns out that in the months before his death, 
someone had made direct deposits to his bank account for some large amounts. It was about 43,000 pounds or about $60,000, but it definitely could not be explained because his job at the hotel only paid about 21,000 pounds per year. After he died, it was discovered that he had about 171,000 pounds, which is equal to about $236,000. And his parents tried to explain all this money. They did not want him to have any type of bad reputation, but it looks pretty weird. I mean, they tried to say he got a lot of tips, but I don't know who would be tipping him that much with direct deposit. Very weird. It's also possible that Henri was used to cause the crash, but didn't actually cause it himself. It turns out that he didn't take the direct route from the hotel to Dodie's apartment. There were reports that the usual road they used was blocked. So he drove past it and took the tunnel instead. And like I said, his blood test showed that he had a really high level of alcohol in his system at the time of the crash. But it also showed that he was taking some prescription drugs. He was taking Prozac and he was also taking Teapride, which is a tranquilizer used to treat alcohol withdrawal. And this could cause, you know, a delayed reaction time or impairment vision definitely could have caused the crash. But what's weird is his family insists that he was not a drinker. He had also spent some time that night with two of Dodie's bodyguards and they said that he had drank two drinks, but that was it. But to reach the blood alcohol level that he was at, he would have had to have eight or nine, maybe more drinks on an empty stomach. And since he had dinner, it had to have been even more than that. Experts say that the amount of alcohol that was in his system combined with the prescription drug would have caused him to be severely and noticeably impaired. However, like I said earlier in that footage at the hotel, he looks completely fine. And what's also very strange is that his blood also showed a very high level of carbon monoxide. It was so high that he should have been unconscious. And since he died at the scene, like on impact, he wouldn't have inhaled any fumes from the car, any CO2. So there's been a lot of speculation about this. And many people think that his blood test could have been possibly switched with someone else, possibly a suicide victim who died of carbon monoxide poisoning. Trevor, the bodyguard who was in the car that night and should probably know more than anybody, said that he did not seem impaired at all. He said that there was no way he was drunk because if he was, he wouldn't have allowed Diana to even ride in that car. Also, the Mercedes limo might have been tampered with. It turns out that it was actually a stolen car that had been bought by a rental company. And it was actually missing this microchip that controlled crucial things, including acceleration, braking, steering, and navigation. Some people even believe that this microchip was replaced with some type of remote control and that the crash was caused from afar. And this part is really strange. This part has always stuck out to me as so, so odd, but Mercedes offered to look at the car for free check it out, see what possibly could have gone wrong. They're the manufacturer, right? But the French police decided that that is not a good idea and they would not let them do it for some fucking reason. And another one of the biggest things here is the fact that it took them so long to get Diane to the hospital. She wasn't in surgery until an hour and 40 minutes after her accident, which is just terrible. I mean, think about if they had moved a little quicker how things could be different, possibly. I mean, we don't know for sure if she would have survived if they moved her faster. There's no way to determine that, but it definitely makes you think about it. Also, people found out that the ambulance was only driving about 25 to 30 miles an hour, which seems weird when you have Princess Diana dying in the back. And they also didn't take her to the nearest hospital. They took her to one out of the way. And like I mentioned before, the ambulance had stopped on the way to the hospital. And at one of these times where they stopped, they were so close to the hospital that it was literally in sight but they fully stopped. And a lot of people believe that maybe there was a reason for this. Maybe the ambulance was delaying things on purpose. Maybe it was to ensure that her injuries would become worse and worse and the chances of survival would be lower and lower. Some people even believe that maybe someone did something in the ambulance, made her injuries worse. And after Diana died, instead of taking her to the morgue, they had her in just this empty room. The staff put dry ice in there and an air conditioning unit, but this was not enough to keep her body cool. And then before any autopsy or any type of testing could be done on her body, they embalmed her. The hospital staff claims that they felt rushed because the royal family was pressuring them to let her be seen by people. And the medical staff claimed that the reason they did this so fast was because they wanted to make her body look as presentable as possible to the royal family. But according to French law, they were supposed to get paperwork 
styled before they embalmed her body and it was done afterwards. Definitely a lot of weird things going on here. All these details together really paint a picture that it's quite possible Princess Diana was murdered. And if that's the case, then who did it and why? During that British inquest, this guy named Richard Tomlinson, who was a former MI6 officer, revealed that the agency had been monitoring Diana and they had a secret informant who was working at the Ritz Hotel in Paris. And he actually believed Henri Paul was that informant. So that would put a lot of pieces together. And he said that in 1992, he was shown plans for an identical accident. And it was actually an assassination plot for a Serbian leader. And it involved the same use of a bright flash in a tunnel to cause an accident. And he actually claimed that using bright lights to blind drivers and cause accidents is like standard practice for MI6 agents. Plus Diana was kind of pissing a lot of people off around the world. One of the things that Diana was working on before she died was a project to clear landmines around the world. It's been a very intense four days. I have seen a great, great deal. I've seen the people affected by landmines. I've seen the landmines themselves. Angola is an example of what the Red Cross can achieve around the world, given the sort of cooperation that we have seen it, that exists between the Red Cross and the NGOs and the Angolan authorities. And she was killed just a few months before the United Nations Mine Ban Treaty was opened for signatures. This treaty prohibited the use, stockpiling, production, and transfer of landmines. And a lot of government officials around the world wanted to stop it, including officials in the UK. Some British lawmakers even started referring to her as a loose cannon. Plus, it was possible that Diana was about to get a lot more power. She was in talks with Prime Minister Tony Blair about a special government role. This role would have given her a much larger and government-backed platform for her causes, so she was excited about it. So with the stakes so high, it makes you wonder, is it possible that intelligence agencies wanted to have her taken out because she was causing problems? Diana was on the radar for US intelligence agencies as well. In 1999, it was revealed that she had been under surveillance by the National Security Agency and intelligence agency under the US Department of Defense. They had a top secret file on Diana with more than a thousand pages in it that are still classified to this day. The NSA has denied that Diana was ever a target of theirs, but at the same time, they have refused to to release those documents. But the most popular theory is obviously that the royal family themselves had Diana killed due to all of the past conflict, her possibly knowing the inner workings and the secrets of the family, and also possibly because of the affairs, possibly because Harry may not actually be her real son. That's a theory. I'm not saying I believe that, but maybe all of this led them to want to get rid of her. And there's some pretty compelling evidence for this theory. Diana described her life living with the royals as a secret hell, that she had to act like she was happy, but said that living in the palace was like being a prisoner. She did countless things that made the royals upset or angry and showed no signs of slowing down. And it seemed that she believed that the royal family resented her and that Charles pretty much just wanted her out of the way so he could move on. And when their divorce was first settled, she was offered royal security, but she actually turned it down because she was afraid that the royals would continue to spy on her. So she hired her own security to keep her family safe. And according to people that were close with Diana in the end, she was constantly worried about being bugged. She was constantly checking everywhere for possible wiretapping and checking her cars to make sure the brakes worked, that basic functions of the vehicles that she used worked. And after Diana died, her butler, Paul Burrell, who says that he has a lot of information on Diana, he claims he was like her best friend and really saw so much of the truth that she was going through. Anyway, after she died, he came forward with this letter that he said she wrote 10 months after separating from Charles. And in this letter, she basically said she was afraid for her life. At one point she wrote, this particular phase in my life is the most dangerous. My husband is planning an accident in my car, brake failure and serious head injury in order to make the path clear for Charles to marry. The princess did suspect that she was being followed, that she was being watched, she was under surveillance, whether it was phone hacking or spying. There were occasions when we pulled up the floorboards and unscrewed the end of the telephones to see if there were any listening devices. The princess wasn't paranoid, but she was concerned. And because of these fears, Diana always wore her seatbelt. And Paul claims this is like a known thing, that she was always afraid one of her cars 
would malfunction. But what's so weird is she wasn't wearing a seatbelt on the night of the crash and no one knows why. Experts have even said that if she was wearing one, she possibly could have survived. Paul claimed when he first read her letter, he was very concerned and he went to her secretary to see if it was true. And he confirmed that Diana really was scared, especially because she had recently experienced unexplained car trouble. Her former bodyguard, Barry Menanke, actually died in a mysterious accident and he was riding as passenger on a motorbike when he crashed into a car. But the thing was, he wasn't just her bodyguard. The two of them were actually romantically involved and she believed that something possibly could have happened to him on purpose. I tell you one of the biggest crashes in my life, which I, I don't find it easy to discuss, because when I was 24, 25, I felt deeply in love with someone who worked in this environment. <sighs> And he was the greatest friend I've ever had. You know, I was quite happy to give all this up. Well, I had all this. At the time, it was quite something to have all this. Um, just to go off and live with him. I couldn't believe it. Well, everyone can. It's and he not... kept saying he thought it was a good idea too. So. I think he was bumped off. She also had confided in her lawyer that she was paranoid that someone was after her and that she was afraid of the royal family. But after her death, the world was mourning. I mean, people were really, really sad about Diana. She was such a loved person and the British people were just traumatized by this death. And normally when important people die, like a royal, the flags are lowered to half staff. This is something we do here in America too. I think people do this all over the world. But anyway, for whatever reason, they decided that since Diana wasn't an official royal anymore, that they couldn't raise the flag to half mass and they couldn't even acknowledge her death. Plus the queen didn't even release a statement right away, which was really odd. But after a lot of public backlash, they finally responded. It took them a week to raise the flag for Diana and a statement wasn't released until the day before the funeral. Since last Sunday's dreadful news, we have seen throughout Britain and around the world an overwhelming expression of sadness at Diana's death. So what I say to you now, as your queen and as a grandmother, I say from my heart. First, I want to pay tribute to Diana myself. She was an exceptional and gifted human being. In good times and bad, she never lost her capacity to smile and laugh, nor to inspire others with her warmth and kindness. I admired and respected her for her energy, and commitment to others. I hope that tomorrow we can all, wherever we are, join in expressing our grief at Diana's loss and gratitude for her all too short life. And a few weeks before Diana was killed, she had been talking about some big surprise. And this started a lot of pregnancy rumors even before she died. The paparazzi were sure that the couple was about to announce a pregnancy or an engagement, something big was coming. But since they rushed her embalming, they were never able to do a test on her body, so we don't know to this day if she was possibly pregnant. But many people think that if the royals had any idea about this, that they would want her to be taken out because of that. In February of 1998, Dodie's father announced that he believed that the crash was purposely planned by the queen's husband, Prince Philip, with help from MI6 because she was pregnant with Dodie's child. And he actually claims that Diana told him that she was pregnant. And this was a huge bombshell. I mean, the fact that his father straight up accused and was naming people, this was big and the royal family was stressed out. And many people have pointed at the queen as the one who called the shot, that she was probably the one heavily involved in the murder plot. But this has been really debated. I think what a lot of people don't understand about the royal family is they do have this separate entity that kind of controls them. There's a lot of powerful people that call the shots in the royal family, in the crown. It's possible that her murder was planned and carried out by high level officials and that the queen didn't even know about it. But some people believe that she did and that to this day, she doesn't want this, the truth to come out about what happened that night. And then in May, 2020, some new information came out from Anonymous, the hacking group about Diana's death. So take this for what you will. The group claimed that Diana had proof that the Royals were involved with human trafficking. They claim that she was about to release taped interviews with victims. Both her butler, Paul Burl, and her sister, Sarah, both listened to 30 minutes of tape interviews after Diana died, including the interview that she did with a royal servant who claimed that he was raped by someone that was close to Prince Charles. But apparently before this tape was ever given to the police, it disappeared. So a lot of people have speculated that if the royal family did find out about these tapes, 
that they could have had Diana just taken out. So there's clearly a lot here. There's a lot of theories. There's a lot of speculation of what truly happened that night. I don't think we will ever know unless some shocking evidence comes out or some information is declassified in the future. As of now, this is closed and the Royals don't like talking about this at all. So of course I want to know what you think. Personally, I do believe this was some type of inside job. I believe that this death was purposeful and planned out but that's just me. But of course I wanna know what you think, so leave me a comment below and let me know. Do you think Diana was killed by the royal family themselves or people that are involved with the royal family? Do you think she was killed by MI6? Or do you think it's Henri Paul's fault? Maybe a combination of that and the paparazzi's fault? I mean, who's really to blame here? Or do you think that Princess Diana's death was caused by the paparazzi? harassing and stalking her every move. But that is going to be it for me today, guys. I hope you liked this video. If you did, be sure to give it a thumbs up. Also make sure you are subscribed to my channel with the notifications on so that you don't miss new content when I release it because YouTube just doesn't like to tell people. But before I go, I wanted to thank today's sponsor, ExpressVPN. Guys, when you use the bathroom, you always close the door, right? Especially if you're in public, maybe in your own house, you know, you do what you want. But using the internet without a VPN is kind of like you using the bathroom without shutting the door. You don't want random people to be able to look in at what you're doing online. There are so many ways that our ISPs can take our information or that our information can be hacked. And a VPN just gives you an extra layer of protection from all of that. And not only does it keep your information private, but it also allows you to unblock content from other countries, which is one thing I love about ExpressVPN. I've used it so many times to unlock different versions of the office from around the world. And you guys can get three months free of ExpressVPN by going to expressvpn.com slash Kendall Ray or going to the link in my description box. That's three months for free of ExpressVPN. Awesome deal, guys. Definitely jump on it and protect yourself online. But that's it for me today, guys. I hope you're having a great day. Stay safe and I will see you in my next video.